Hello, everybody in Facebook land and YouTube land. This is Alan. I've got Rob and Anthony here with me, and this is Modern Musicology. Rob, how you doing tonight? I'm great. How are you? I am wonderful. Anthony, what's going on? I am doing well. It's Sunday. Tomorrow's a public holiday, so I'm feeling pretty good tonight. Woohoo! Tomorrow's a public holiday? Yes, it is uh, the holiday formerly known as Columbus Day, now known as Indigenous mm -hmm. Peoples Day. I wonder if I have to go to work tomorrow. I know I don't. So, uh, I do. cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what's some of the stuff that's happened this past week in the music world. Um, Rob, you had something that you shared with us that just kind of came out today. Yeah, Paul um, McCartney news. So I, like everybody else, have been waiting and waiting and waiting for the Peter Jackson uh, Lord of the uh -oh. Beatles thing to come oh. out. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for that. I'm um, so excited. I believe it's tentatively coming to Disney Plus November 25th, mm -hmm. 26th, and 27th. That is correct. I don't know if it was the same everywhere, but uh, each night is two hours. Yep. Um, so Insane. And apparently they had to drag him away from editing, like kicking and screaming. Um, <laughs> and the unique thing is that he managed to do something a lot of people don't have. And he's got, he got pretty much everyone to cooperate, which is pretty great. Yeah. But, uh, so that's coming, which is a whole cool thing on itself. But he, he just did an interview um, in England and they were talking about, you know, the Beatles and someone asked him, you know, how do you, the context of it was, how do you think the Beatles would have, you know, gone on, you know, had you, not left. And so he kind of just stopped and said, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't break up the Beatles. He's been sitting on this for about 50 years now. Yeah, and, everybody knows it was Yoko. Um, but Kidding. he's like, one day, John, you know, his story is basically one day John came in and said, I'm leaving the Beatles. You know, and he says a lot of it is that John kind of wanted to have a life on his own, not in the, not in the hectic, you know, busyness that was being in, in the Beatles. He just kind of wanted to slow down a little bit. And um, so everyone in the band's like, okay, we're done. But in the meantime, they, they just had gotten shortly before a new manager. And the new manager sort of said, okay, let's keep a lid on this for a little bit until yeah. I can finesse it and get it ready. Let's tie up all the loose ends and then announce it. Yeah. So um, the plan was to sit on it and sit on it. And, you know, and like like many of us who have problems that just stew and stew, McCartney's like getting tired of this, right? So he's mm -hmm. just like he just said we broke up. So it looks like it's a two it's a two th segment thing. First Lennon mm -hmm. leaves, the band's like, okay, we're done, we're gonna sit on, it. and then and then Paul for his part is like, I'm tired of sitting on this, we're done, right? Right. So it's interesting because he's been sitting on that for fifty years. Yeah. And I I can imagine. You know, just having people tell you in the same way that Yoko is probably tired of it as well. You broke up the Beatles, you know, mm -hmm. after 50 years, you're probably a little sick of hearing that. Right. Right. Um, and I haven't seen any video from the interview, but from the transcripts of it, it looks like he's a little. Yeah. You know, a little, little touchy. Um, I, and I just think it's interesting that, you know, there's uh, the Beatles you know, all these years after this breakup are still sort of mystifying and intriguing and they still give us newsy, new, newsy stuff and they continue to surprise us. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think this seems like pretty much the confirmation of something that most of us knew all along. The impression mm -hmm. I'd always got was John walked out and I didn't know about the manager telling him to sit on the news, but I did know it was Paul who eventually had to go and file all the paperwork to formally dissolve the partnership. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, th that was the impression I'd always had. Um, and it's nice to actually see that explicitly spelled out by one of the parties who was involved at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I think for people that follow the Beatles, this is by nowhere near, you know, shocking news nor mm -hmm. revolutionary. And, um, but I think that it's, it's, I'm like you, Anthony, it's something I pretty much suspected all along, but I feel, I don't know why I feel this like sense of closure, just hearing it. Mm. Um, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, we're done talking about this. Right. And I think, you know, I think part of the reason McCartney has been talking a lot about the Beatles and why they broke up and things is because Ringo's also talking about it. 
Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, and the way that they're talking about the Beatles and particularly John hasn't been disrespectful or very, you know, hostile or anything like that. It's been very interesting how they're meticulous in picking their words and what they say, but it is, it is fascinating. I think that just, we finally get some clarity on that. And I think, you know, I, I have a couple yeah. of friends that are Beatle fans. They're like, Oh, wow. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting that he's still, having to talk about this. I mean, he's got a book out, he's getting ready to do a tour. He's got a million things going on and people are still asking him about why the Beatles broke up. Yeah. And oh, it's yeah. got to drive him nuts. It's got to drive him nuts. The breakup was 51 years ago at this point. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you know, he spent 10 years in the Beatles and 51 years as a solo artist slash wings. I mean, I w at this point I would be pissed off if people were still <laughs> asking me, I mean, admittedly, they're one of the greatest bands of all time, but 51 years later, come on, guys. I've, I've got this entire body of work to talk about that's not the Beatles. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I'm far more interested in knowing why Wings broke up. <laughs> I would love to ask him that. Just eat probably right. <laughs> They got fed up of being on the run. Uh, no, get out. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well played. Well played. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to the the massive documentary that's coming in November, Thanksgiving weekend. So I think that there's going to be a lot more light shed on all this stuff. And just out of interest, where will be where where will we be able to watch that documentary? Wow, that was awkward. D Disney Plus. Disney. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the three nights of um, Thanksgiving weekend, two oh. hours per night. Holy smokes. But that two hours per night includes the entire final concert, the rooftop concert. Um, from what nice. I understand, like even like, you know, they started a song, stopped and restarted and finished the song. So even that is in this documentary. So every minute of that rooftop concert. So yeah. I'm excited. And I'm excited. And from what I understand, McCartney and Ringo had never have never seen it until until he got he showed it to him yeah i think i heard that somewhere as well so i would love to see their reaction to this stuff i i you know i know this sounds kind of weird but when that comes out on dvd i i want them to have a commentary track exactly Ex that's totally what i'm looking for all right so uh anthony you had some news for us this week too yeah so it came out a few weeks ago that um Judas Priest had to postpone the majority of their U.S. tour because one of their guitarists, Richie Faulkner, had what they called a major heart condition. Yeah. And this week it came out what uh, it came out as to what happened, and it turned out that while he was on stage at a festival in Kentucky, I think it was Louder Than Life, they were doing their encore. He was playing Painkiller. And he had, and I have to read this because I'll never remember it because I'm not a doctor. He had an acute cardiac, uh, cardiac aortic dissection, which Jeez. is basically, you know, one of the aorta's ruptures and blood starts spilling out of the heart. Oh my um, God. The fortunate thing about playing in Kentucky is uh, he was four miles away from one of the best cardiac units in the entirety of the US. Wow. Um, so they got him there extremely quickly. He was in surgery for 10 hours, and apparently if he'd been playing any other um, venue on the tour, he probably wouldn't have made it. Because wow. he wouldn't have gotten to a facility quickly enough. And certainly not a facility wow. as good as that. Right. Um, he's clearly um, taking it with a little bit of humor, as well as his, holy shit, I'm lucky to be alive. But he's, <laughs> he's been talking about how you know he's got so much metal in his chest now that he is literally made of metal. Made of metal! Uh -huh. Which is pretty awesome. Um, That's funny. I'm, I'm also amused that he is the youngest member of Judas Priest by a good 30 years, and he's the one that actually has mm -hmm. a major medical condition. Um, yeah. You know, bring, in, bring on someone younger, they say. Less chance of him dying on stage. Nope. He's the <laughs> one that nearly did. Um, but I'm really happy that he made it. He seems like a super, super nice guy. I've seen interviews with him. I've seen him play in Judas Priest, and I saw him play um, back in... I want to say it was 2005 uh, with Lauren Harris, who is Steve Harris of Iron Maiden's daughter. 
Um, and he's a phenomenal guitarist. As mm. I said, seems like a lovely guy. He's got a young family. Yeah. I'm so glad that he's pulled through. Yeah. Um, and Judas Priest are going to reschedule those um, those dates once he's well enough to play. Wow. So I had heard about um, the condition last week, but I hadn't heard the details of it. Yeah. Until now. So, oh my God, that's just it, terrifying. In the interview, he talks about looking at the video, the you know the fan video that's up on YouTube, and he yeah. can see like the yeah. look of kind of pain and confusion on his face yeah. as he's starting to feel sick and has no idea what's happening. <sighs> oh my god! But he made it. He, he yeah. got he got really lucky, and I yeah. think he knows it. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay, so another big news story that came out this well it's actually a, a sort of an addendum to a new story that came out a few weeks ago and that is all the nonsense surrounding uh the cover art for nirvana's uh nevermind album spencer eldon the kid who was at four months old thrown into a swimming pool naked and had his photograph taken and uh, has sort of lived with this album cover for his entire life, um, has recreated the album cover at many, many, many different points of his life, usually, well, always in either swim trunks or shorts, never naked, you know. But he has recreated the photograph for this thing. He has gone on um, interviews and talk shows and stuff about this thing. And as an adult, had the word never mind tattooed across his chest. So one would think that he's totally fine with this situation and fine with the notoriety that has brought him. But now he has filed a lawsuit against Nirvana naming 15 different uh, parties for child pornography and uh, you know, some kind of like emotional restitution. I need millions of dollars or whatever. Um, so the thing that happened this week is Dave Grohl, has responded. I think this is the first time he has said anything at all about it. Uh, we're coming up um, on the 30th anniversary of the release of the album, and they're talking about uh, re-releasing in a special package that album. And his comment is basically, we can think of lots of different ways that we can alter that album cover, you know, hinting at like, you know, I think this kid's got some I don't know. It's going to be an interesting to see how they actually do this. Well, I think um, this whole lawsuit reminds me of one particular scene in a sitcom that I know that you and I, at least Alan and possibly Rob, are very fond of. Money, please. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> right. I mean, I, it, he just doesn't have a case to stand on as he has basically embraced this thing for his entire life, you know, he's hoping, and now, they'll, set, he's hoping they'll settle out of court. Oh, I mean, sure. If he goes that, to court, he's not going to get a dime. No, but. of course. That's what he's hoping. And I hope they don't, you know, I mean, at the very least they could pay for him having never mind tattooed on his chest. I wouldn't want them to give him any more than that. But anyway, that's a, I just thought it was interesting that Dave Grohl is like, has, has now spoken on the, the, subject and seems to have uh something funny in mind for the re-release that'll be interesting it just seems completely asinine it you is know, mm -hmm. if you had you know if nothing else is his there's also the issue of you know his parents probably would have had an issue with him being on the cover when they were that young um when he was it was his, yeah it was, it was his father that uh negotiated the whole thing yeah, and I, and it was basically a handshake agreement. There was no contract. There was no, you know, so, you know, the kid's got nothing to really, you know, stand on other and, than it was his image. But, and, you know, I don't think anyone at the time really realized. Oh, what, no. I mean, not for, I mean, like having worked in college ready at the time and having gotten that record a week before it came out. And I remember we got it, went in the studio a bunch of us and listen to it and we knew yeah. it was going to change the game right we knew like oh my god this is amazing but we had no idea it was going to be this right no no but, one had that, any you know, idea like that well hopefully this guy and courtney love can have a party somewhere and, and just live in peace and quiet <laughs> <laughs> that's true who else has got some 
stuff from the past week. Well, Rob, you did. Oh, okay. well, I didn't know if Anthony had anything. I was being nice. No, well, I, I, I did mine. Okay. Now, yours is, <laughs> yours is intriguing because I literally was having coffee with somebody the other day, and they were talking about, like, how metal guys, like, are just, like, they're, they're unnatural in their, in their health, in their luck, and their ability to hold alcohol and drugs, unlike other musicians. It's a pact with Satan. Right. It's, I mean, that's... It's, That's what's behind the whole thing. It's utterly fascinating. So, um, uh, being you know, being a person of my age, all of the really great and interesting musicians that um, I grew up listening to are in some way, shape, or form, you know, dying. It's a part of life, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, earlier this week, we lost Everett Morton, the drummer from the English Beat. Um, mm -hmm. Alan, I'm sorry, a lot of these are drummers. Um, please, you know, put yourself in a in a bubble. Um, <laughs> And what's interesting about those English beat records, like if you listen to What Happened or Special Beat Service, right, the percussion is everything on those records. Because, mm -hmm. like, I mean, to me, Ska was like, okay, it's, you know, I listened to Madness and the Specials and everything else was kind of there, right? Yeah. But, like, the English beat had this really great sense of rhythm and percussion. And a lot of that's Everett Morton. Mm -hmm. So uh, he passed away this week. And it's interesting because, like, we're losing all these real, like, a couple people in specials have died now. That generation of, like, ska two tone guys are all starting to go. And I think it's kind of an unheralded uh, bunch of musicians because it's, it's yeah. kind of the combination of, like, traditional music they grew up hearing from their cultures, but also you get reggae with that and you get dub and you get a lot of soul. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the case of ska, I mean, um, his in his playing you know affected people like Stuart copeland right and you know a lot of these drummers that came along later that had this sort of funky thing going on a lot of those were contemporaries of him or influenced by him and i think that's interesting and then uh the other person who passed this week which is really sad is pat fish from the jazz butcher or the jazz butcher conspiracy um they were one of the sort of unheralded creation record bands in the 80s and 90s they wrote songs that are crazy. There's like Shirley MacLaine. There's uh, a really great song they wrote called Looking for Lot 49 about the book. Mm. Um, he's got a new record coming out. He was only 64. He's, you know, his new record's coming out next month. But the, the Jazz Butcher always sort of were one of those um, bands that were like in that indie creation movement that kind of still had a sense of humor. Uh, David, David J uh, from Love and Rockets and Bauhaus played on some of their records and he has a, uh, there's a jazz butcher record called uh, domestic animals, which at the end of it is it's the only record I know of. That's not an album record where they actually use a, like a, a rubber ducky at the end. Um, but they speak a little rubber ducky at the end of it. And it just, it totally okay. like caps it off. Right. Um, <laughs> but their records were really great. So I, I wanted to mention that. And then and Alan, I did not know this uh, until earlier today. I did not know that Alan Lancaster from status quo died. Oh, the basis I don't think I did either. founding member of Status Quo. And I just always remember my first exposure to Status Quo was Live Aid. Me too. Well, I think I'd known the name before I that, had but I hadn't, yeah. I don't think I'd, I certainly hadn't seen them play before. And I don't know that I'd even heard a song. I knew who they were. Yeah. And I think, I think I remember rightly when uh, Live Aid happened, I was like, I finally get to hear what Status Quo is and what they sound like. Yeah. Because I remember they were a ton of they were a ton of jokes, and then I knew a lot of guys that <laughs> that liked them. And I've got an yeah. English DJ friend of mine who friggin' loves them, right? Mm. And I heard this, and I I, I kind of backtracked after I read this, and I had no idea just how many people love status mm. quo. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, as as a music person, I I kind of misjudge that, which is kind of sad. Of course, we should be saying status quo. We, we should. We should. <laughs> I was going to bring you guys up. I knew you were going to correct us. <laughs> I, the, the thing I always loved about quo, I mean, my, my first um, exposure to them was my dad had a bunch of 60s compilation albums because that's when he grew up. He was born in 1946. He was in his teens and 20s and 60s. And I remember hearing pictures of Matchstick Men, which is not... Mm. You know, it's not really typical of a lot of their kind of 70s output that they're better known for. You know, they're better known for the for things like whatever you want that are just more traditional semi hard rock, mm -hmm. I guess. Right. I wouldn't call it hard rock. I wouldn't quite call it soft rock. Let's go with semi hard. Right. Um, 
but I I love pictures of Matchstick Man. That mm. kind of psychedelic era um, yeah. of theirs is underrated. But the other thing I love about them as a band is they always had a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a friend of mine when I was in college going to see them on their tour for the album In Search of the Fourth Chord. And, you know, the, the, the joke is they only knew how to play three chords. They only chords. play three chords. So yeah. I, I love that they always did yeah. things like recognize that and play homage to it and kind of play off of it. They yeah. were a band with a great sense of humor. And, you know, the fact that Alan Lancaster was their founding bassist, I mean, he must have had a huge influence in their direction, um, certainly in those early years. So I think, you know, it's a huge loss. And I think it was, wasn't it MF, multiple sclerosis yeah. they died from? Yeah. And the, yeah, thing, that's rough. the thing that's interesting, too, is that they kind of had the reputation at Live Aid as kind of being the people that kept it light. Um, you know, you watch a lot of the documentaries, a lot of the oral histories of Live Aid, and they're kind of always sort of around. Like, they didn't, they, I think they played first. They didn't care, right? They did play first, yeah. They're like, yeah, whatever. We're just going to play first. And they sort of, I, you know, they've always sort of been really light and not taken themselves too seriously. Yeah. Uh, which I think is maybe well, and I think that um, Geldof really sort of like talked them into slash badgered them into playing first because he wanted the show to start with the song "Rocking All Over the World." Mm -hmm. That was he was determined to have that, so I think that you know he kind of like got them to yeah open like like probably told them this is going to be the most special slot of the entire day. Mm -hmm. You're going to be the first thing everyone sees. Yeah. It'll be the most important thing that happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other thing is I don't go to a ton of jazz shows. I kind of, I kind of pick my spots and read. Like if it's somebody I'm not familiar with, I, if it seems interesting, I'll go. But I saw Dr. Lonnie Smith play twice. Right. Mm. So the thing about Lonnie Smith is he played keyboard. He used to be in the, in, in George, George Benson's band. And, he, he first of all he was not a doctor uh in real life but everyone <laughs> called him a doctor because he could just take melodies and go with it right <laughs> nor was he a muslim but he wore a turban and he just wore the turban just because <laughs> he just thought it looked cool right yeah which i thought was kind of funny but um he played the hammond organ in the same way that like hendrix played a guitar right yeah or miles played a trumpet he really sort of made the hammond organ like this totally new instrument and his stuff is just like out there, right? The records he made with Lou Donaldson are great. Check those out. They're on Blu-ray. He made a record uh, in 2021 called uh, Breathe that's really good. And it's sort of like this... Yeah, I know we're talking about organ music, which is kind of weird, but um, it, all these really amazing jazz musicians are going. And no, and, and this cultural heritage, at least over here, Anthony, because we're all dumb, don't, um, <laughs> don't spread this, right? Because more people in Europe know about our jazz and blues musicians than the average American does. Um, but Lon Lonnie Smith is just friggin' amazing. I mean, Prince was a big fan of Lonnie Smith and um, Jenna Monet is. Um, mm, he yeah. just did this and, and an early influence on Stevie Wonder. Um, just an, just his, I mean, his stage shows were just crazy over the top, you know, kind of like Sun Ra light. You know, mm, in that yeah. sort sort of thing, but not as not as nuts, but just you know, psychedelic in that sort of jazz way, as opposed to the rock way, and really kind of interesting. So yeah, the last couple of weeks have had like a lot of interesting people go. You know, and I think last week I talked about Richard Kirk from Cabaret Voltaire. So um, yeah, we're losing a lot of really interesting musicians not just like oh the drummer from this band died or whatever but a lot of musicians who have interesting legacies and interesting whose lives are interesting stories to tell yeah um you know and the thing about lonnie smith is that he played with literally everybody like lou donaldson all the way back through like a lot of these blue note bands and stuff um and that carries over because a lot like a lot of the stuff lou donald a lot of stuff lou donaldson and Lonnie Smith did, you know, you can hear that on Young Americans. You can hear it on, mm -hmm. you know, The Weeknd. You can hear it in, you know, a lot of different new records and stuff that are all coming out. So it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting. So that's mm. our segment about death. Oh, boy. Sorry. Thanks for Thanks, bringing God. the ring down, man. Sorry, man. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, man. 
it's important to talk about that stuff, you know? Yeah, I know. But and it's so. important to remember these people. Yeah. Uh, so I've got one other thing, and that is uh, Deep Purple has announced this week that they are going to be releasing their very first all covers album. Uh, it is their 22nd album. Um, their last album, Whoosh, just came out two years ago. I think it was, or less, no, yeah. it was less than that. It was only, yeah, it was less than that. It was like a year and a half, maybe, maybe just a little over one year. Um, so this is their 22nd album. It is called Turning to Crime. They have just released the first single, which is a cover of uh, Seven and Seven Is by the group Love. And they've released the track list for the whole album. And it's a really interesting collection of stuff. There's, um, they do Oh Well by Fleetwood Mac. They do Jenny Take a Ride, Watching the River Flow, which is a Bob Dylan song. Um, Ray Charles, Let the Good Times Roll. Little Feats, Dixie Chicken. Um, the one that I was most surprised by, um, the White Room by Queen, which is, uh, Cream, which is a great song. The one that I was most surprised by is uh, sort of an old uh, war ballad um, called The Battle of New Orleans. And it's by Johnny, Johnny Horton. Horton. And it's, uh, it's a story told about one of the battles in the War of 1812. And I grew up listening to Johnny my parents Horton. play Johnny Horton records. Friggin' love Johnny and Horton. I was like, and I was, I, this seems like such an interesting selection for them to include on this album. So interestingly, it looks like they might specifically be covering the Lonnie Donegan version. And of course, Lonnie Donegan was a British music hall artist who, you know, if you're a band from the 60s or the 70s and you kind of grew up in late 40s, early 50s, yeah, Lonnie Donegan was the biggest name in town in Britain. I mean, yeah. you know... You, you, there wouldn't be a Billy Bragg without a Lonnie Donegan. Right. I, I always find it hilarious. The US was putting out, like, Elvis and, you know, these early rock and roll artists and we're like, oh, we, we got Lonnie Donegan, who's basically a skiffle artist. I mean... <laughs> yeah. You know... I, and, <laughs> Yeah, and skiffle music is is amazing. Uh, Billy Bragg's book on skiffle is probably the best book on best thing I've ever read on skiffle. But I have a British friend of mine who's really into rockabilly and skiffle, and he just made me a tape years ago of all this. And Lonnie, you listen to Lonnie Donnelly, you're like, wow, this is amazing. Why don't we know about this? Yeah, hmm. I remember so, being introduced to him by my grandfather, who played me uh, "My Old Man's a Dust Man" as well as uh, "Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight." <laughs> and they are really, really fun. Very oh, that's silly. awesome. <laughs> um, a lot of fun. Definitely check Lonnie Donegan out. But I think it's interesting that Deep Purple are probably paying homage to his version of the Battle of New Orleans. Yeah. I saw his name listed alongside um, Johnny Horton's in the track list. So that's, that's, that's a really yeah. interesting inclusion. Uh, so, the album... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was going to say the album concludes with a medley... Uh, which is a bunch of crazy stuff thrown together. Um, going down, Green Onions, Hot Lanta, Dazed and Confused, and Give Me Some Lovin'. So it's going to be, I'm not a, typically not a big fan of well established bands doing cover albums. Um, you know, Styx did one. It's the only Styx album that I do not own. Rush did one. It's the only yeah. Rush album that I do not own. Queens Right did one. Don't care. You know, I just, I, it's just not something that interests me. Yeah, um, I, I like the way Metallica did it, where they Metallica released... is a is an exception to the rule for me. Well, also they released it as a bonus um, mm -hmm. CD with an album of originals, so it wasn't like a standalone right. here by us doing other people's material. Well, right. I'm thinking of the one that they've done too. I guess I try not to think about Garage Inc. But I, I was thinking about the last one they did um, that came with their last album. Mm -hmm. That has some really good stuff. That's more of a compilation of covers they've done here and there. There's like their Dio tribute. There's their yes. Iron Maiden tribute, Deep Purple, yeah. and it's really, really good. Yeah, Garage Inc. is what I was thinking of, and that, and it's a good album. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it has its. Moments. It's just, it's just not, it's just not a thing that I'm typically interested in. I really you like know? the cover of Astronomy from that. Hmm. I do see. I just, I just don't really care about hearing, you know, Getty Lee sing "Summertime Blues." I want to hear a, a Rush album, you know. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of a stick in the mud that way. I will say, Ace Frehley has done two now. 
called Origins, and they are really good, surprisingly good. How do you so, feel about um, like single track covers? Like you know, you oh, release fine. an album of nine new songs and one cover. Oh yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. There, it, a lot of times these cover albums tend to, you know, it, they can be done as like a contract. You know, buy out the contract. Let's just get the you know, run the contract out with, we have to do one more album. Let's just throw this together. And of course, Bowie did one um, right after Ziggy uh, pinups. And it was because uh, the, the whole Ziggy mania exploded and they were, they, they had, he had material written for another album, but they hadn't done anything with it yet. They were still on tour and the record label is like, we need new stuff. So they just went in and bashed out a covers album of stuff that basically this is stuff that would have influenced Ziggy, you know, so they still sort of themed it and it's good. It's a fine album. They did some original stuff with the covers that they yeah. did. Yeah. But you know, it's still my least favorite Bowie album. Well, actually it's not the first album is my least favorite. <laughs> his, uh, his, co his cover of C Emily play on that is great. Oh, it's so good. Mm -hmm. So good. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. deep purple hitting the, Hitting the records, uh, the, the store shelves again. So two quick points. Um, Dave Gahan from Depeche Mode is also doing a covers album that got announced this week. Oh, yeah. I forgot about um, that. He's doing like a Cat Power cover and some other stuff. And I, I wasn't really paying attention to it. Cat Power I, has a new album of all covers. Well, Cat Power puts out a lot of covers. She albums. does. That's true. And, this, and, is like and, the, and, this is like the third in a trilogy. And they're not, they're not necessarily terrible. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> the Dave Gahan one, I'm interested in sort of hearing how that sounds just because I don't know how much he's going to expand out with what he does. Right. Right. So I thought that's kind of a cute little sidebar that mentioned that. Now, here is your useless Johnny Horton fact for the for the evening. Right. Um, no Johnny Horton fact is useless. Having grown up hearing Johnny Horton records and having 19 different ones in my collection because I'm weird. Um, so first of all, Johnny Horton had an affair with Hank Williams' wife. Right. Mm. He died in a car accident on the same road on the same day, I believe, as Hank Williams. Wow. That's sort of an urban myth thing. I don't know how much it's true, but if you go hmm. um, if you go to Shreveport too, there's a little plaque for Johnny Horton where, hmm. where, where his car crashed. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. But there you go. That's your useless Johnny Horton story for, for the day. And we can get on to real, real things that people care about. Johnny Horton and Roger Miller were the two things that I heard growing up from my parents. Yeah. And just random country radio. Yeah. Okay. So I've got one last thing that I want to kind of throw out there. Um, I am in a Bowie tribute band and yesterday was my first show with them. I just joined a few months ago and uh, there's this big event. Um, in sort of the Decatur area here in Atlanta in the Oakhurst neighborhood. And it's called Oakhurst Porch Fest. And I've heard about this for a few years now and I'd never been. So we got booked to play and it's basically this huge neighborhood. It's not a block party. It's a neighborhood party and it is massive. Uh, I had no idea how big this event really is uh so we get to the place where we're supposed to play and it's literally a guy's driveway and this there's like bands set up all over this neighborhood like every house has got somebody that's going to be playing at a certain time and everything is scheduled out so there's no two bands in any like one street or block or whatever playing at the same time so you can kind of mill around and see all the stuff um there was uh there was an acoustic group you know around the block and Two down, two doors down from us, there was a group that was doing like seven of these acoustic covers um, at two o'clock. We went on at three o'clock. Um, we had a good crowd when we started. Um, four or five songs in, there had to be 150 people at least nice. on the street, in the yards, on the two houses around us. I mean, it was in, it was massive. It was, it was incredible. So we burn this show we played uh we started with life on mars so kind of like a, a really quiet but then a slow build mm -hmm. we played the entire ziggy stardust album nice and then we ended with gene genie and heroes and so well, right in right in an hour and um 
like, I mean, people seem to really love it. The guy who had booked us to play his place, um, he said every person he talked to afterwards said, you're having those guys back next year, right? So There you go. <laughs> exactly. That's what you want to hear. So I, go ahead, Anthony. Go I ahead. was going to say, am I, am I right in thinking it was your singer's second show with the band? Well, first and a half, since he only did half of that first show. So first full show. First full show, yeah. And you guys have a new bassist as well. A new bassist. Right? It's his first show as well. So big, big times for Jerome. Yeah, it's crazy. The band fell to <laughs> and let me tell you, Caleb, the the singer, this this being his first full show, his first show as the guy fronting the band, and he burned it down. I mean, he just Whoa. lit up. He's had 18 months to prepare for it. Yeah, man, he was, he was so good. He's he was, so engaging with the crowd. He was good in that first show. Mm -hmm. I mean, candidly, he had big boots to fill with yeah, Joey. With Joey. And, and Joey and filled them. Joey came to the show, except he went to the wrong place. So he came as, right as we finished the show. <laughs> but it was so sweet to see him. It was so great. <sighs> All right, so I guess that wraps up our past week. So let's get into our main topic, which is uh, No Time to Die. The new James Bond movie opened this week. It's the closing chapter in the Daniel Craig uh, saga. And um, interesting situation in that the movie was scheduled to release a year ago. The single, the theme song, got released a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, and, uh, did well, um, Daniel Craig was it, uh, at that time he appeared on SNL as a host and, to promote the movie and then everything shut down, no movies, nothing. And so here we are. Finally, the movie is in theaters, uh, with a single that was released over a year before the movie came out. <laughs> so let's talk about some Bond theme songs. Uh, where do we start? What's one of your favorite? And so I want to say for people watching, uh, feel free to uh, comment and share with us what your favorite Bond theme is, um, who you would like to see do a Bond theme at some point, um, questions about the Bond music, anything. So run with it. What do you, what's some of your favorite ones? What, what was, or do, do you remember the first one you ever heard? Uh, the, I, the earliest one I remember hearing is live and let die <clears throat> me too uh and for me again that was one of on one of my dad's compilation albums he had a 70s compilation album and <laughs> that became iconic for me just i knew it as uh, when i was like five years old as james bond music i didn't know the right. title to me that was that was the james bond theme and as far as right. five-year-old me was concerned that was the only theme the movies had <clears throat> See, I first heard it when it was released as a single on FM radio. <laughs> I know I'm the young in on this. On this, that's podcast. okay. Um, that's okay. I may be old, but I've seen all the great bands. The first, okay. So this is technically cheating. The first one I heard, although I didn't realize it was a Bond theme, was "We Have All the Time in the World." Oh yeah, which is still wonderful. Um, oh God! It's but beautiful. I grew up. I grew up in a house hearing a lot of stuff, and that was one of the things yeah. I heard. But I had no idea it was a bomb theme. And then I'm like, "Oh wait, that's a bomb." Okay. Um, I remember "Live and Let Die." I remember sort of like I was young, and I remember that you know my my brother and my sisters were like really really into Wings. Yeah. And "Live and I'm like, what is this? it's like? What what's a James Bond? You know, I don't I don't know what that is. You know. Yep. And then like "Live and Let Die," this is great. So I like I like live and let die. Um, I have a soft spot for we have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I also really love. I've come to love uh, the view to a kill. Um, mm. Oh, I love that. Just song. just because it's so uh, it's so over the it's so overproduced and it's so loud and it's so it's sort of like it sounds like the eighties. You know, if you were to pick one song that sort of has this like eighties sound like a bond theme in the 80s that's kind of in the argument for it being there i mean mm -hmm. um i really just sort of like the bombast to it and it's like this is really cool mm -hmm. um and i like that and then you know i still like uh for your eyes only too which i have to be in a mood to hear but i appreciate it much more now than i did that 
It's funny because, uh, you know, Bond themes are hit and miss when it comes to radio success. But there was sort of a string in the mid 70s uh, where they all were kind of hitting. And it was um, it was the McCartney and Wings song, of course. There was um, Nobody Does It Better by Carly Simon was a huge hit. Fear Eyes Only, Sheena Easton was a biggie. Um, and then there was a lot of other ones that just didn't really, you know, chart at all. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking of that song, uh, Phil Fogel says, For Your Eyes Only was the first and the reflex Duran Duran. I'd like Robbie Williams to do a Bond theme. His song Millennium was a Bond homage. That's cool. I don't think I've ever heard that one. I don't I, think I've heard Millennium. I remember when that came oh, out. Yes, I did. And his video was very Bond-esque. And at the yeah. time, people were saying, maybe Robbie Williams should be the next Bond. And even at the age <laughs> of, I don't know, I must have been like 12, maybe 13. I was sitting there thinking, what the hell are you talking about? No, he could do a Bond theme, but yeah. he's never going to be Bond. No, no. Please, please God, no. Um, <laughs> I know. Can I talk about favorites? I yeah, of course. On my first. So Please. I, I find I have a type when it comes to Bond songs. <laughs> um, and I don't know, maybe it's cliched, but I love the ones with a very strong, powerful female voice. I'm talking Goldfinger, mm -hmm. Diamonds mm -hmm. Are Forever. Nobody does it better. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they've come back round in every time the... Uh, franchise kind of reinvents itself. They kind of bring in that kind of voice again. You got Goldeneye oh, sure. mm -hmm. when they, they brought in Adele to do Skyfall. Mm -hmm. I mean, that kind of vein for me is just iconically and quintessentially Bond. And I think that's right. what it should always be. I would be fine if that's what it always was because I always think of that with Bond. Um, you know, I went through a, a period for about five minutes where I was like, Adele is the greatest thing. And then I just got really over her. But Skyfall is a fantastic song. And I almost said Spyfall, but that's Doctor <laughs> Who. <laughs> that's something else. That's a very different thing. And there was no theme song for that. She, but yeah, so, I, and I still love that Adele Bond song. And quick tangent. Um, you know, I think she's a very, very good singer, but she's oh, overplayed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't want to say overrated, but she's overhyped and overplayed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to kind of get frustrated when she releases a new album and all you hear about for the next year yeah. on radio, on yeah. social media is Adele. Well, it's, it's almost like that with everybody, though, too. It's kind of, you know, there's yeah. always somebody that's like that. But yes, you're right. You're right. But she's had, she, I mean, she is so good. She's had that with every album she's done. Whereas right. most others, it's a like, and that's a sign of the quality. Mm -hmm. Equally, it's it's easy to get fed up of hearing nothing else on the radio for you know the best part of a year. Yeah, there was a, a period for a, a few years where um, the the two figures that were sort of seen as the savior of physical media in terms of record sales was Adele and uh, Michael Bublé. Like people, <laughs> well, and also uh, that uh, that lady who won Britain's Got Talent, Susan. Oh, Boyle? That, that huh? Yes, Susan yes, Boyle? yes. People came out in droves to buy their albums, mm -hmm. and that was what was like. People were saying that's the only thing keeping, you know, the record industry afloat. You know, is that those people release albums. So Adele definitely has a a power to her. Oh, 100%. She had talked uh, for a while about like really wanting to do a country western album for her third album or fourth album, whatever. And it's, it's so far not happened. It didn't happen with the last one. And I don't think just from the little snippet that has been released, it doesn't sound like that's coming in the next one either. But I would love to hear that. I would love to hear her do something, you know, different. I'm waiting for the Adele heavy metal album. Right. Yes. <laughs> my my problem with Adele isn't necessarily that she's terrible. I've just heard this before, and it's called Alison Moyet. Ooh. Yeah, well, good point. <laughs> but I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I Alison know. Moyet's not really, you know, done anything I know. in I know. a while. I know, so. but it's just like all these people are like, ooh, this is great. I'm like, well, if you've listened to music for a while, you know. <laughs> I, I, just just I apologize. Dusty Springfield. I mean, you yeah. know, I'm just saying. 
No, you're completely right, Anthony. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I kind of agree with your assessment, Anthony. Um, and, of course, the three Shirley Bassey songs mm -hmm. are top of the list. Four, if you account, if you count uh, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which did not get released. Um, and that one, I thought it was a good song. They weren't happy with the recording of it, and they weren't happy with the way she pronounced Kiss Kiss Ban Ban and just decided not to use the track, and uh, Dion Warwick re-recorded it. Um, but I, I love all of hers. I love all, all four of hers. I think they're wonderful. I think Goldfinger is naturally the best of the best. I mean, that's so yep. iconic The you know, the for want of a better term, the sting, yeah. the ba -ba -da, yep. made it onto, you know, the Austin Powers soundtrack. It's just that <laughs> iconic. I also, too, though, think there's something about having orchestration with it. Mm -hmm. Yes, agreed. Um, agreed. I love John Barry. I think John Barry is probably one of my five favorite composers for film scores and stuff, but he really knows how to frame a voice with music. And with the Bond films, you know, because of him, Bond themes are events, you know, be mm -hmm. because like he, he was able to take a voice like Shirley Bassey, right? And not overwhelm it with the music, not overstate it, but also not understate it which for a composer is really tricky to do. Um, all of those, all of those Shirley Bassey records are like spot on in terms of like how the vocals are, mm -hmm. how the music arrangement is, how the breaks are. You know. Yeah. I tell you, um, talking about orchestra, there, there are a few that I haven't, I had a hard, much harder time getting into. And that is as much as I love Chris Cornell, you know my name just did not feel like a Bond theme to me. Even mm -hmm. though I really like the song a lot, it just didn't say Bond, you know? Yeah. And yeah. the Jack White and Alicia Keys song, um, Another Way to Die, I thought was a good song. It just didn't really say Bond to me. No. So I had a hard time connecting with those. And fucking Sam Smith. God, I can't stand that guy. Or that uh, person. When you were talking, when Anthony was talking about Adele, I just really wanted to say the same thing about Sam. <laughs> yeah. So a friend of mine was at high school with Sam Smith. Okay. And they were in choir together, and her exact words about him were, "Yeah, he was a good singer, but the little shit damn well knew it." Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there there is an arrogance about him. Um. I, I liked that song, though, in all honesty. It worked with the film. I mean, I think, too, the other thing yeah. is picking the song to go with the film. Mm -hmm. One of the issues I have with the Jack White thing is that it it's not a bad song. It just doesn't work with the Bond film. So it's almost two things. The song has to match the film in some weird sort of way. Um, it has to sort yes. of embody the spirit of the film. And I think sometimes they got ahead of themselves and put songs on there that are like, Okay, you too is gonna do a bomb thing. We're just gonna put it on here, you know. <laughs> so, well, you know, and that's some of the criticism that uh, "Die Another Day" by Madonna came up was that it, whether or not it works as a Bond theme, and part of this is the filmmakers instead of you doing a sort of separate um, title sequence with the song playing over it, they use the song as like well, the title sequence was basically a continuation of the storyline, and it was all torture of James Bond and the fans were like that song is the stupidest choice in the world to use in a torture sequence you know other than the song is torturous well, um, I, was, I was going to say I think it was perfect for that film because it was a shit song for a shit film <laughs> <laughs> see okay I personally like the song a lot I, I actually like it as a song I don't like it as a Bond theme That's right funny. right and that's the distinction. It is. I just it is. Get that bob in about. <laughs> 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 it's probably my least favorite Bond movie. So right, there's that. Okay, so what is your favorite Bond movie? Oh, from from an actual film perspective. Film, yes. Um, you know, I'm gonna go with uh, License to Kill. Good choice. 
Dalton's my favorite Bond. I think I it's a freaking love Dalton. <laughs> it's a crying shame he only did two. He did oh, the, I agree. The harder, grittier Bond before yep. it was cool. Yep. Um, and you know they they screwed him over. I hundred percent agree, and I love love both of his films. Mm-hmm. Same. Rob, what's what's your favorite Bond film? Uh, he kind of stole mine. Um, oh, sorry. Look at us we being all in agreement. I'm we shocked. Can have the same one. I know. <laughs> um, there's still something great about Thunderbolt. There's still something great about Doctor No. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. But the first one I remember coming out in real time and being able to sort of understand a lot of the the stuff in it and kind of being a lot. Oh my God, it's so embarrassing. Um, I just remember Moonraker being a thing, right? And I thought the car was cool. <laughs> and Moonraker. yeah, it's not my favorite, but it's it's kind of the one that I remember like going, I'm going to go see a Bond movie, right? Right. Because I saw the other ones before it, but that's the first one I saw in an actual theater. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that. Um, I don't hate the Brosnan films. Um, mm. I, I, you know, I like the, I liked his sort of hard take on Bond as well. Um, I do like Die Another Day. It's kind of strange. Um, yeah. God, this is like trying to pick your favorite doctor, isn't it? Um, I, so, so Rob, just on the Brosnan films, I, I think you and I might be the opposite because I always felt like they were diminishing returns. I loved Goldeneye. And then mm-hmm. they just they, mm-hmm. they they steadily mm-hmm. kind of decrease. And, and this is the me. thing: is I love. Here's the thing: I love Goldeneye a lot, and it, it's it's like the movies that he did. So much, so could have been better, right? A lot of his films at this point, actually, any film after Goldeneye that he made, could have been better. He made a whole series. It's like Liam Neeson. He made a whole. They have a club where they get a yacht and everything. They made a whole series of really mediocre movies, but they're the best things in them. And you will watch them just to see him and forget about everything else. Um, but going buddy, back to Bond, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, my buddy Phil calls me into question with my love of the Madonna song because he thinks it's the worst Madonna song ever. I think there are worse songs than that. I think Madonna has done worse things than Die Another Day. Gonna ask that one with um, Nicki Minaj and MIA comes to mind as probably <laughs> the worst Madonna song ever. I, th- I think anything from Madam X is the worst Madonna song ever, but that's just me. That's just me. And no, no disrespect to anybody who does love Madam X or whatever else. Um, but it, you know, talking about the uh, Brosnan films, I think that the the themes were diminishing returns too. I think some of the blandest. Bond themes came from those movies. Yeah. I love Cheryl Crow, but the song just wasn't no. that exciting and freaking garbage. I mean, if you can't get okay, a good I mean, song from if garbage, any, if there's okay, first of all, Cheryl Crow, it. Cheryl no, Crow, I know exactly. But Cheryl Crow had no business being near a Bond fan. I'm sorry. <laughs> and she's from I'm here, so I can that. say that, right? She hadn't, but you just think garbage is a band. You kind of be like, ooh, they could really do this. They could. Right? You think that, and you're like, yeah. okay, I kind of get this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I really was excited when I heard they were doing a Bond theme. And mm-hmm. then they crapped all over the floor, and I was so sad. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, I do love the AHA song. From of course it's from a bond that I love, but so I'm you know I tend to you know love the songs more from those you know any bond that film that I love I'm gonna like the song too. But I, I thought Living Daylights was a fantastic song. So I'm gonna voice an unpopular opinion. Okay, I actually um, really liked Another Way to Die as a song. No one else does. I like it. And I like the song. I like the song a lot. Okay. Just not as it doesn't feel like a Bond song. Exactly. Exactly. It's missing something of the it doesn't work well with the film. That is my only issue with it. Yeah. But I think the the combination of those two artists was really cool. It was something that I was looking forward to hearing. And and you know, when you separate it from the context of the Bond franchise, I think it works fine. I would be really interested. Did did Amy Winehouse's 
song ever leak? And not that I know of. I'd be interested to hear that. Without a doubt. I think she was a, a natural fit mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. any Bond. And, you know, and, and I love going back and looking at the things that were recorded and submitted and considered for Bond songs that never happened. Uh, I think those things are so interesting. And I think that she's one of the ones that could have knocked it out of the park. Yep. But like, um, what's the one that Alice Cooper did? Man with the Golden Gun. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. One of my, probably my favorite, well, one of my favorite Bond themes ever is uh, Thunderball by Johnny Cash. Just mm. a fantastic song. And it fits him so well, and it fits the tone of the movie so well. Um, there was, um, was it For Your Eyes Only? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, Blondie did one. Um, it was for your eyes only. It w- was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. And that one's okay. I mean, you know, it's okay. Well, you, you look at who submitted for Tomorrow Never Dies, Pulp. There was a ton of them. St. Etienne, mm-hmm. Mark Almond, mm-hmm. the Cardigans, Space. Right. I mean, that was. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I know. And I've not heard uh, at least some of those I haven't heard. Pulp's and I one's was, pretty good. Yeah. Yep. Um, so what else? Um, what's another one that I just can't stand? Let's get one. <laughs> oh yeah, that. Uh, speaking of man with the golden gun, the Lulu song. It's okay. It's fine. I'm not sure that it's any better than the Alice Cooper one that was rejected. But <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I I know it was the very first one, and that's why it doesn't fit. But just Kingston Calypso. Looking yeah. back, it doesn't feel like Bond. But again, Doctor No, no was the first Bond movie, so yeah, I don't it think didn't the... matter what did and didn't feel like exactly it, anything retrospect. could have... right because I don't think the ethos had been established yet. Right, you know the whole like spy genre that James Bond ended up sort of defining just really hadn't defined yet. Yeah, yeah. So I know I agree, but it's it's still a fun song. It's still cool. I love hearing it. Um, all right. So any final thoughts about James Bond and are you, have you seen the new movie yet? And are you looking forward to seeing it? If you haven't seen it, I have not seen it. Um, I'm still not really in a position where I particularly want to sit in a theater with other people right now. So I will wait till it's on streaming media or physical media and watch it then. So look forward to seeing it in five, six months time. Right. Rob. If I go, I yeah. will go. There's a theater by me with vaccination only. And, oh, interesting. Um, they have an 11:30 in the morning on a weekday. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm, there's no way I'm seeing a movie on a weekend with full crowds. I I don't really go to like the megaplex for for a lot of movies anyway. Um, yeah, but I I tend to go to like. Um, like art house places, but a lot more of these films are showing in art house theaters now because they have to survive. So I, I'm only if I I've only gone to a couple movies and they've all been at the at one theater where I know the management and I know they're not nuts and they got a new ventilation system <laughs> and they will throw you out if you're not wearing a mask. Right. You know. But I'm still not really big on going. So if I go, it's going to be early morning on a weekday. Right. It's like me and some guy who's like 78. Who's going to complain about the Bond isn't Sean Connery anymore? But I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, so you're going to go see it with my dad? Cool. No. <laughs> you know. I I did go see uh, Shang Chi in the in a theater, yeah, and too. and there was only like four other people in the theater, so yeah. I I don't feel too unsafe going to a theater right now because in at least in my area at the theater that I go to, no one else is going. So yeah. when I saw that, there were like five fine. people there too. Yeah, and I I will not not see Dune on a big screen. So I will pick a time and I will pick a, an off peak times, you know, just to mm-hmm. go and and sit in the theater with maybe one or two other people and I will see that damn film on a big screen. Yeah. So but I'll wear a mask and I'm fully vaccinated, so even if it's and, and it's, so far like the parking lot is continuously empty. 
at this yeah. place. So mm -hmm. it's so sad. I don't know how they are even open. But anyway, so um, that's James Bond in a nutshell. So thank you both for joining me again this week. Uh, we will see you next Sunday night. We got to figure out what we're going to do once Doctor Who starts up. Yep. Damn Doctor Who taking our Sunday night slot. Depends what time it's on. Well, Is it on at eight. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you all. Thanks for folks who watched. Uh, we will be back next Sunday evening at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And until then, we will see everybody later. Have a good week. And we are out of here. <laughs>